Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Virtual Stars podcast. How my loyal listeners, thank you for your continued support. And remember, click the subscribe button, everybody. It's an amazing episode because Steve Orlando boards the Muller ship. You know him as the writer of Batman and Justice League of America. He's now the writer of The Scarlet Witch and Exorcist Never Die. Come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Orlando. Thank you so much for coming to the Traversing the Stars podcast. Happy to come on. It's an honor to speak with you, sir. You're actually you're one of the best writers, so it's an honor. <laughs> well, thank you. So I always start off with a question of inspiration. What inspired your love of comics and who were your earliest influences? Well, the thing about my love of comics is that it's kind of been there nearly from the start. Um, you know, I my father sold sports memorabilia and I was not a sporty child. Uh, so I would uh, I would go to him, uh, go with him to flea markets and things. I grew up in central New York and um, there would always be comics there as he was like looking for like good finds when it comes to sports stuff, specifically baseball. Um, I would always be looking at non sports cards or even better, the the dusty boxes full of comics. So. Uh, when I say it's almost always been with me, it's because I was like two years old and I picked up an issue of West Coast Avengers. It was West Coast Avengers 16, A Tale of Two Kitties. Uh, and I barely I couldn't even read really then. But I but I did know I was entranced by, you know, the the the, the wild colors and the wild characters and pictures. So very early on, perhaps as a response, uh, pardon me, as a response to uh, not being that sporty at that age. You know, I, I was looking for something to do, but I was I was hooked and I was in deep and. And, you know, I get in deeper all the time now, many, many years later, <laughs> 35 years later. <clears throat> so it's been there for a long time, but I didn't buy, uh, we didn't have a comic store in my town at the same time. So I didn't buy like something that was like day and date until I was pretty old, like 10 years later when I was like 12 years old. Um, and at that point, uh, I mean, it was Grant Morrison and Howard Porter on Justice League. That's where it was at for me. Uh, it was also John Ostrander and Tom Mandrake on Martian Manhunter. So those are the two of the first ongoing I ever collected. I did a bit of the Clone Saga, but again, that wasn't day and date. I was picking it up from like a Walden books. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it's hard not to say Grant Morrison. I think it's pretty obvious in my in my work. Um, and, and from there, you know, you, you look at people like Milligan, you look at people like Rachel Pollack. Uh, you look at people like uh, Rutu Modan and and, and those, the, those, I would say, were my chief influences. So the important question is that West Coast Avengers, do you still have the copy? Uh, I did until last year when I sold off my collection of floppies uh, yeah. to, to help put a down payment on a house. So it's a very adult answer, but I certainly still own it uh, in digital on Comixology. Very cool. So you've had an amazing, least successful career. Um, you, um, as a, especially you've written for Batman, which is like the premier comic book series as well. So what keeps you motivated to keep on writing and how do you still find ways to challenge yourself? Well, I mean, there's the there's the boring answer, which is to say the bills keep coming. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, the bills keep coming for everybody, right? Mm. So, uh, well, for most people. Uh, so it, it's not just that because I'm lucky, you know, writing writing comics, working in comics, uh, it's work, you know, like I still have to get up and work every day. But it's still one of the best damn jobs out there. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that motivates me is a is a um a level of defiance, a level of spite. Again, like I'm from Syracuse, spite. I mean, if I didn't have any blood, I would still be alive because of <laughs> spite. And and the thing is, is you know, the creative in arts, you're not entitled to a job here. Like the thing is, so one of the things my mentor told me for years, uh, starting when I was 12 years old, that same year is the, that I first bought a day and day comic is when I decided I wanted to work in comics and started going to shows to try to break in. And from that moment, uh, my mentor, Steve Siegel, said, look, you're not owed a job in comics. You're not owed a job anywhere in entertainment. So part of why I keep going, like, this is, a, this is one of the best jobs I could think of ever having. Uh, it is work, but it's a privilege to be able to, to create things, uh, to, to pay the rent and, 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 and put them out in people's lives. So that is sort of, uh, you know, and it's both where the inspiration comes from. Uh, and, and, and it's why it, it, it's relatively easy to keep going. I'm not going to say that it's like sunshines and rainbows, uh, all the time. Like I, I get pissed off like anybody else, uh, maybe even more, um, because I'm just that kind of person. But at the end of the day, 
uh, I'm extremely lucky to be able to have this job. You know, mm -hmm. I worked for it. I worked uh, 20 years of, of, of pitching books before I got like a workable, livable gig in comics. So it's not like it happened overnight. Um, but there's a level of humility there. Uh, you know, you know, like I, I, I have a job that is enviable and it's a great gig and, and to keep it. Yeah. I got to keep going. I got to keep consuming, uh, different types of, of media and, con uh, and, and content and stories, uh, and digesting them and then putting them back out as comics. Uh, and, and look, what better gig could there be? You know, mm. like I take, I, I take in stories from all different, you know, prose books, poetry. I just saw a play on Rachmaninoff this past weekend, um, and and then I take what I you know what what inspires me and I put it onto the comic book page, uh, you know, in collaboration with some of the best artists in the industry. So uh, it's a lucky place to be, and I'm very aware that you got to hustle to keep it, and and I want to keep it. So 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 that's why you see me working. Everybody always says, "How do you work this many books?" Listen, I wish I could only write one book a month. That does come into the bills aspect of things, but also like this is one of the best jobs in the world. So mm. I'm very aware of that. And, and I'm going to fight like hell to keep it. And and that's why you'll see me a lot of places as often as possible. You, you have won so many awards in the industry as well. I mean, do you ever sit back and go, I've mastered this art. You know, I am master of comic books at this point. Well, absolutely not. Cause if you think <laughs> that you're an asshole, uh, <laughs> but, but also, well, and, and listen, I, I don't mean to like fact check live in the air, but I've actually only been nominated for a lot of awards. Uh, but I haven't won yet. So there's always that. Um, but the reality is, no, I never will because, because, uh, the industry is always changing. What, what folks want is always changing. How we tell stories is always changing. And even if it wasn't, uh, I don't look at writing comics that way. I'm the first person holding a baton in a relay race that is making a comic, but it's impossible to be a master in my opinion, because you're still part of a team and, 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 unless you're a jackass that the things that the, the other people in the creative team work for you, uh, you must give up a level of control and you must give yourself up to the collaboration and know that, you know, what you do, you, you aren't really in control. You're the first start of a conversation. And, and to me, that's part of the joy because then you get surprised by your own work, you know? So yeah, I like, I, I think I know how to put a, put a story on a comic script page pretty well at this point. I've done it in almost every format imaginable, uh, but that's not a finished comic, so I can never be the master of it. But what I could be the master of is inspiring my artists, respecting them, and starting a conversation that gives all of you a kick-ass fucking comic. Well, you're the writer of a fantastic comic book that I got a chance to read, Exorcist Never Die, which is absolutely wonderful. Uh, so what inspired the creation of the series, and what aspect intrigued you the most about it? Oh, I mean, like, it's twofold. It's the chance to do a heavy action book, which I have, I, I, I've i loved doing since my first DC book with Midnighter. I love a book where heads can explode and the action can be creative and subversive, um, sometimes a little disgusting. Um, and that'll happen in Exorcist Never Die, especially issue two with Lust. Um, but at the same time, I also love Christian lore, you know, like I... I'm sure the you know the the ver the, the the metaphorical comment section will uh, light up, but I think it's only a matter of perspective and when we're born that we look at the amazing stories within Christianity as being any different from the amazing stories that turn into things like Thor or things like that. Like it happened, you know, if we were alive 500 years ago, Christianity would be a we uh, like a stranger mystery cult, and or, or or maybe longer than that. Forgive me for pulling ears out of my ass, but if we were alive in the past. You know, the thing that was real and, and vital in people's lives would be some of the people that we've turned into superheroes now, mm. you know, uh, so and 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 I think that. Illuminating uh, any type of folklore and mythology uh, is always really, really exciting, and that's separate from people for whom that it is powerful and real, like I, I respect that that's for them. But at the same time, I love the chance. I think I'm not personally Christian myself, I'm a secular Jew, but I, I think the stories within uh, Christian mythology are fascinating. I, I, I spent half my college career working on John Milton stuff. My advisor was a John Milton scholar. Mm. So I, I think the the epics told within there are, are fascinating. And so to interpolate them into um, an action fight comic, very, very exciting for me. One of the first pitches I did that never went anywhere was uh, essentially like a Christian mythology take on, 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 on Thor uh, with Lucifer as the star. And it was called morning star. And it was a similar thing where finally he had been a pompous asshole for so long that he gets bound to a human body and he has to 
and he has to redeem himself. And he's not interested, of course, in redeeming uh, what he did in the rebellion as per John Milton, but he is interested in getting a better life for his soldiers to whom he feels an obligation. So um, it's... Uh, that's a long answer, but the longer term of it is I, I, I love the stories. I love I, I love the narratives, even if it's not something that I personally <clears throat> see in a spiritual sense. And so it's exciting to be able to put that on the page in a new way. So when you're writing something with that much um, basis in religion in the story, is it a difficult tightrope to walk to make sure it's not offending someone or is potential offense part of the excitement of doing a book like that? Uh Potential to for to offend is certainly a possibility, um, and I don't. I would never go out uh, trying to uh, trying to offend uh, something that is important to someone. I think that whatever you believe in, that's that's a personal choice. The only time I have an issue with it is when it extends beyond being a personal choice. I mean, life is terrifying and then you die, right? So like whatever you need to do to get through that, amazing. And that's great for you. And, and, and you know, to quote weirdly, Shit's Creek, like I love that story for you, uh, but it's for you uh, and, 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 and not necessarily for me. So no, no, I mean, like the potential is always there. Um, but at the same time, like you can't be hampered, uh, you know, by something uh, that is not by no means universal and, and by no means and by no means, quote unquote, true. Uh, so that's sort of the line for me, like like we have to tell a great story that's exciting uh, and and provocative, but it's provocative in, in what we say about human nature, uh, not what we say about a specific type of mythology or lore. Um, and, you know, if there are people that are not into that, that's totally their right. You're not going to hear me say that they're obligated to buy it. Um, but it would also make me an asshole to go out purposely and try to offend what's important to someone. Um, now, of course, if they show up to me and tell me I'm going to hell for <laughs> sleeping with men and being Jew or being a Jew, which has happened both in my life, well, they can fuck off because then it's not a personal choice. But uh, I do I do have a lot of respect, again, for what works for people on an individual level. So when you have a char characters, um, Ellen and Sid, um, in in with who are your protagonists in the story, be because they do exist directly connected to angels and I assume the a, the Christian God. What is is there such thing as faith for them, or is it different when you know there is something there instead of having the faith that there's something there? Oh, that's such a good John Constantine two thousand five <laughs> quote, my man. He doesn't have faith. He knows. Um, I think it's an interesting question, um, you know, and I don't I think in the world of exorcists never die. I don't think that you ever see there's still a level of mystery, right? One of the things that I do appreciate about not just Christian mythology or, or Judeo-Christian mythology, but most belief systems in general is that there's a level of mystery um, cause even as a secular person, you have to accept that there are things that you simply won't know. You might appreciate it in a different way. You might approach it in a different way. Um, but there are things you'll never know. Hell, that's, uh, the reason we did the shadow versus Batman at DC is because the, the shadow represented mortality for Batman. Batman's the world's greatest detective. And he had to just accept that he would never know who the shadow is. Mm -hmm. And that's accepting his mortality, you know? So, uh, I think that that Sid and Ellen absolutely know that angels and demons are real, but there is another level, right? Like they never meet the boss, for lack of a better phrase. Mm. Uh, and and I think that's how it should be. Like there are things that are beyond mortal understanding, and that's not necessarily owned by any type of one mythology. Hell, that's also the tenet of cosmic horror. Um, and and so and and I don't think they're that different, right? Like, how often do you have these 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 narratives or someone is presented with uh, the, the face of God and just like the the or any type of creator deity and like just the very approach of them like blows their face off. Right. Because it's so, yeah. so so I don't think that that's that different from cosmic horror, actually. Uh, and I think that that's a wonderful thing. So they they certainly like this is the job for them. Uh, but there are aspects eventually where they, you know, like they can't go any higher. There's an invisible ceiling, for lack of a better term, where they have term where they just can't go. And that's where their individual beliefs come in. Now, are they motivated? They know more, I guess I guess the clean way that I could have said this before <laughs> running my mouth is that they know more than us, but they don't know it all. Right. So are they motivated by a need to serve God or to serve their fellow man? 
Oh, absolutely. Their fellow man. Right. Because I don't think one way or another that uh, if, if they are people who still have that top level belief, they don't think it's up to them. So in the same way that, you know, regardless of what a firefighter thinks God's plan is, he's going to go in and save you from a fire. They're going to go mm. in and save you from a demonic possession. The rest is above their pay grade, for lack of a better term. So are we going to get a more of a backstory of how they got to where they are as exorcists? Um, well, they're already uh, they're already exorcists, even in the in our flashbacks and exorcists never die. But what you will get is a lot of backstory on 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 their personal life and, and why things didn't work out for them. Um, and that's because we're treating this gig, this exorcist gig, like any other gig. Right. You know, like the uh, Sid comes from a family of uh, an iconic family, the Kennedys of, of exorcism, you know, of combat exorcists. Uh and uh, and and it's always been very easy for him. And meanwhile, Ellen is is the exact opposite. She not only is she a woman of color, not uh, but but she she doesn't have a family name that's well known in the industry. So she has had to fight and claw three times as hard as Sid has for half as much. And eventually, we we see that this just was the breaking point in in their relationship. But that was long in the past. And and now what you will see is we'll give you enough in the past have context for how they've changed as people in the present and hopefully they've changed enough to you know survive uh going to the bottom of the hell scraper now i'm gonna uh, paraphrase um I, I guess it's okay to, to i don't know if this is a spoiler uh, uh um that um but one of the demons that he finds out is one of the seven deadly sins in in the first a uh, sloth in the first issue is that too much of a spoiler i don't I listen. I'm all like the fact that the seven deadly sins exist in the book. Don't even consider it a spoiler. That's a selling point. So let's dive in. All right. So um, I'm going to paraphrase something that Sloth um, discusses in the first issue. I almost it's a bit of a paraphrase. He said that um, heaven and hell, those who fight for heaven, are at a disadvantage because heaven behaves and the exorcists only get to borrow angelic power, while demons directly possess the living. Basic uh -huh. paraphrase is, is like two paragraphs. So let's. I'm going to dive into those concepts. Okay. So my first thought is the idea of following the rules and one side doesn't. Why? You know, what are the rules there? Why is there this idea of following it versus the demons who don't have any rules? Well, to me, that is sort of the archetypal archetypal divide. If you go back to Milton, um, which I is what I always go back to when it comes to to, to Christian mythology, for me at least. You know, Satan, Lucifer, was the first romantic hero in a literary sense. And his rebellion is over the fact that humans have free will and, and angels don't. So how does this play out in this book? It's that, yes, technically any, any type of um, uh, hero, uh, hero fantic agent, be them be them ha angels or demons, are only supposed to influence or or lend their powers uh, to 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 the right types of mortals, mortals who know how to channel them, like the combat exorcists. Um, but demons don't follow orders, right? Like demons have free will, uh, and 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 again, they don't play by the rules. By definition, what ended up, what made those fallen angels demons, going all the way back, is not following the rules. So it it just seemed right to me that we would have like these. We would have these these rules again, like in Constantine 05, like influence. That's the deal. Except, of course, why the hell would demons ever make good on their word? Like they're demons. Right. So here, like we have rules, but like anyone working for the side of quote unquote good is at an automatic disadvantage uh, because they actually have to follow them. Um, but at the same time, there's perspective there. And I think that's the key. Like I don't, you know, uh, very, very little is by chance in the world of story. Uh, and I'm not just talking about myself. And so like the upside, of course, is that, yes, demons possess people, but they 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 lose what is gained by having angelic powers channeled through a human body. And I think when you actually see where the book ends up and you can see how they um, how they defeat each demon, uh, each seven, each of the deadly sins in each book, it takes a human perspective to understand how the concepts they represent could be countered because it takes someone who's experienced and been subject to those sins to know what the counterweight is to them. So while demons have an advantage in a physical bludgeoning sense, in a tactical and skillful sense, I would say it's quite the reverse because they know nothing of human perspective. All they do is step on human souls and jump right into the bodies. So uh, it's certainly a case they think that they have an advantage and in raw power, maybe they do. 
but uh, power is not all there is. There's also skill and there's also experience. So, so what is the end game for the demons? Is it just prove that they can take over these humans? In other words, I know part of the idea of Lucifer was to prove, just to prove that humans are corruptible. Is that the end game or is their end game bigger than that? Well, it depends which, you know, take on Lucifer you want. Because again, in, in Paradise Lost, he's kind of unconcerned with humans. All like, like his, his main urge uh, and drive is that, you know, this, this army of people stood behind him and he let them down. You know, he thought they were obviously he thought they were going to win. He thought they were going to get free will and, and they didn't. They lost big time. Um, but in the case of this book, uh, you know, what, what's the, the end game is the soul auction where they, you know, which is basically a fire sale for, for human souls that they've rounded up at the, at the bottom of the hell scraper. And as to who's buying, you'll see in issue six, uh, you know, there are, there are mechanicians within hell. Uh, but this is, you know, this is basically two people trying to bust up, um, an infernal fire sale for lack of a better term. But of course that for every soul sold, that's a life lost. So it's not like they're selling widgets or something. So can we go a little, um, dive a little bit deeper to the concept of a of the auction? What is the the value of what is bought at the auction? Is it was again? Is it souls equal influence? Is it souls power? Is there something else that you gain from being in the auction? And what is, I, I guess, what is be what is used for purchasing, as it were? I think that you. The soul is many things like like for people in hell. I think that the hell lords uh, and to be clear, like the the sins that the the exorcists are facing, they're not in the auction. They're just kind of the doormen, uh, you know, um, working for who will reveal at the end of 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 issue six. Um, but they're both medium and currency in hell. You know, like there are there are you, you know, there are a few things that mortal people from mortal folks that extend beyond uh our 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 mortal existence but that is one of them at least in the lore of the book so it is a medium you know like like demons can if they if they control someone's soul they could certainly inhabit them while they're still alive as happens in some cases uh in the book as you'll see um but they're also currency they're also a form of of wealth and, and a way to climb the social ladder within hell and you know even though lucifer himself might be a romantic hero uh, that doesn't mean a lot of people under him aren't just as conniving uh, and evil and and or I shouldn't say evil, but opportunistic uh, and and incapable of get of seeing the point of of this whole thing uh, than him. So I, I like you have people who want uh, as much cultural cachet as possible because they want as much power as possible. They want to be in the Lucifer spot, but, you know, uh, they haven't gone through what he went through. So so uh, while I'm pitching him, uh, Lucifer himself, as perhaps a tragic figure, I would argue that the people raised under him are anything but because they haven't gone through what he did. So another, in, as, as we mentioned a little bit earlier about the idea of rules and interference, the demons are on the front line themselves. They are there through, even though the presenting humans, they are there, while the exorcists are only borrowing power. So the angels are not directly intervening. What does that suggest about God and the angels that they're not willing to go on the front lines the way the demons are on the front line? Well, I think that a lot of that depends on your lens on 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 what it is when it you know what re, what human nature is, what respecting free will is. Uh, you know, look look at the world, right? Like you know, Hannibal Lecter, God, which is weird that I'm quoting him, but like you know, God loves people. God kills his own people all the time. He just dropped a church on a bunch of them. You know, like that's paraphrasing. Yeah. Uh, but I think key, if you go back to Paradise Lost and you go back to the concepts in general, is that for better or worse, like these are entities uh, that have enough respect for us as a people, as a species, as a creation um, to let us live or die on our own terms. Right. So, mm -hmm. so they are willing to give aid and influence, but at the end of the day, um, the story of humanity is the, is one of self-determination. We have to we have to take our own wins. And I think that that maybe in the in the scheme of heaven and hell sounds a little crazy, but it really isn't because uh, people need dignity. They need to own their victories. And 
Uh, it's a concept I, I write a, a lot about ever since I started doing disaster relief with one of my friends. Um, but you need to help people the way they want to be helped, not the way you think they need to be helped, mm. uh, because then you're just helping yourself. Uh, you're just imposing yourself on them. And once you're imposing yourself on them, that doesn't sound a lot like free will. So when it comes to the non-demon side, uh, yeah, it's about giving us the tools. Um, but to be clear, it's very important uh, that they're putting the tools in human hands and allowing humanity to liberate themselves uh, from these threats. So I'm trying to think the best way to phrase it, is the lack of intervention on the side of God and the angels, is it faith in humanity or is it lack of investment? I don't know if it's either. I mean, it's dedication to the original thesis that that these that we're going to be creatures that are that have self determination, and so you know, it's not like they're doing nothing, right? Like like if you if you are a combat exorcist, you can wield the the powers of an angel for a limited period of time, um, but at the same time, like what 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 then? What after? You know, if 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 this happens and just some like some angel of, of of a power and magnitude we can't even comprehend is like blips, blips down to earth and solves it for us. What about tomorrow? Mm. What do we feel about ourselves? How do we feel independent? Like, like there's an understanding in the fact that again, folks need to be given the tools of course, but self-liberation is how you maintain dignity and, and, and how you build a, a path into a future uh, for yourself uh, and for society. So what does it mean to, borrow the power of a particular angel well that depends on the angel you you know see like you see without within the first book and as things go forward um every every angel has a different power uh you know so we're pulling a bit from uh, a lightly polytheistic take as well uh or at least a, if not power a different domain uh that, that they rule over and uh or concept and it, you know, you, you, yes, you, you gain those powers, you gain those abilities and sway over a fraction of that domain as a human when you do a God flow, but also important, you know, like they, they don't always work the way you expect you, uh, what comes into play is your own perception with not just of, in the case of the seven deadly sins, that sin and that concept, um, but your own problem solving connections, right? Like it's, it's very easy to think that, oh, you just need you just need the new, you just need the most powerful one to hit something real good. But that's not how it works in our book. You know, you, to, to counter lust, you have to first understand what lust is. To counter sloth, you have to first understand what sloth is. You know, like it's easy to see a demon and Sid's reactions just hit it real hard. Um, but hitting something is not the opposite of sloth. Uh, it is, it is, you have to find something that, that, counters the concept of inaction. Uh, and, and so by having these different angels illuminate these different concepts, again, we're really using it as an engine to, to, to show character and show how, these, how our leads perceive the world. And all, of course, the influences and vices around them. So what does it mean for the angel that's being tapped into? Do they, they're so powerful, they notice their being, power is being tapped? Is it something that they have to allow to occur? How does that work? I think that the, the 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 beings that they're tapping that they're channeling are so vast in scale uh, and also exist outside of time and space. So I mean, uh, it's not that they don't notice, but it's like a it's like it's like a it's like a fly buzzing around them or like a mosquito biting them, right? Because they mm -hmm. they they're omnipresent. Time doesn't really work in the same way outside of reality. So, you know, what seems like a climactic event for a combat exorcist is like uh, someone blinked, you know, <laughs> you know, for them, because it's kind of all happening at once or it's happening on such a grand scale of, of, of many, you know, quintillion years that they've been around that, you know, what's five minutes. Right, right. So I think another thing that's kind of interesting is, once again, you're featuring these seven deadly sins. What does it mean to kill a sin? Like, can they be killed? Are you killing the sin or you like itself almost? Or is it they're just like some, some um, avatars of it? How does that all function? Well, it's the real people, but they're exercised. Right. So they're not dead, but they are sent they're, 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 they're basically they get they get kicked off the mortal plane. So, you know, what would it mean to destroy them? That's a very Neil Gaiman -y question. <laughs> uh, but for better or worse, we're just dealing with them, dealing with kicking them the fuck out. 
uh, <laughs> to, to be quite honest. And 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 in that case, again, it takes first understanding what they're truly about. So I think another thing that's kind of interesting is that within this world, within this context, obviously we have the demons, we have angels. What does that mean for the people in this larger world? Um, that demons, do they know these demons and angels exist? Is it sort of like, is it um, something that's just part of their life? Is it just what's going on in this one building then? And it's kind of, people are not noticing the larger picture here. How does that work in the, for the regular people? I don't, th- I don't think the average person knows they exist. I mean, again, like look at how we view uh, the strange right now. Our, our first inclination is to say that it's bullshit right like uh so so i don't think it's out of the realm that that these underground and and semi hidden things happen and 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 the uh the average person doesn't know because well again you know look at it like uh we we want to believe something is horseshit um i you know like and it's hard it's hard to put uh something that is hyper real like a comic story into the lens of 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 reality and I was watching the show C with my boyfriend, which is a great show, in my opinion, on Apple Plus. Mm. And he was like, well, why would they, you know, why would they treat the, which for folks who don't know, it's 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 set in a post-apocalyptic world where like 500 years in the future, everybody is, is unsighted. Uh, and, and a very few people are sighted, but they're treated like witches and they're outcasts and they're hunted. And he was like, well, why wouldn't they, you know, why would they do this? Why would they treat them like this? But I said, you know, okay, but you're saying that because we have sight and we think it's normal. But how would we treat someone who suddenly had like telepathy right now? We'd fucking kill them. Right. Like, we'd be terrified and we'd fucking kill them. So we don't want to look at the thing that frightens us. And so I think that there's maybe like scant evidence out there, but people probably think it's conspiracy nonsense, you know, in, in mm. this world or they, or they write it off uh, or or they just look away. You know, because we are, for better or worse, as people, we love to look away. We probably like to think that we wouldn't. Um, but in reality, like if you're walking down the street, you probably look away if you see something strange. Like I said, I find this book to be absolutely incredible. I think it was a well done book. I think it's absolutely fascinating. Um, do other fates have a role in this as well? If how, Or how do they or they view by the concept of the demons and the exorcists? Or is that not part of it? Well, you know, we're focusing on Christian mythology in the first book, but I that's an that's a question I would I would love to explore uh in future books because given enough time, then you're then you then you uh start to really dig into uh, you know, my views as a creator, but also the question of like they can't all be this is one of the reasons originally that I struggled with with or at least organized religion. They can't all be right. Right you know uh or if they are then what we're doing is basically all looking at the same thing and seeing it it's like marvel's galactus right Right? like everybody sees galactus but they see something different um he's not literally just a giant purple dude (laughs) Um, and so it would be interesting to to get into i think about how uh in promethea alan moore had like unified i think it was promethea had like unified he had like uh, like all of the sky gods were like one being and, and and you would find out that like people just saw different aspects of them. So it would be interesting to really dig into in future volumes, the question of like, really are these even angels and demons or is that just what we're calling them? Because that's the nomenclature we have. Mm. You know, maybe it is all one thing, you know, maybe, maybe if there's an angel of fire, he is the same person as Apollo or one of Apollo's children. Uh, but these are just the way that our tiny human minds uh process something that is so grand and magnificent that it would just be mind-breaking otherwise i think about like um you know again like 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 there's there's the zoriel arc of grand morrison's jla you asked one of the first books i was reading that was one of the first books i was reading Mm -hmm. and yeah you know like you have you have uh, uh Asmodel and just like the you know the light of heaven that he releases is so blinding that anyone except Superman would just be vaporized by it. Yeah. So I think it would be interesting to explore whether or not this is all one thing, and whether or not the you know whatever higher what whatever extra dimensional uh, existence these these beings have, uh, for them it's all one thing, and and for us well we're just we're putting it in boxes because that's what we have to do because if there's no boxes like our eyes would melt and our brain <laughs> would come out of our our mouths and things like that. So it would be interesting to explore in the future for sure. 
I, I I think so. I mean, at least I, I think when the concept of it is so um, fascinating because I really think just the concept of the being an exorcist in that world that you've created to have that existence to know some or think or believe something is there like the angels, especially if as you go with your idea that. If what, if it, what you think is true is not even true anymore, how does that affect their own concept of who they are as well? I it, it's just I think you your book I think opens up so many possible theological questions that is very interesting. Well, and if I have a point, it's it's not that one is right and one is wrong. Mm. Um, it's the point I made earlier that whatever is right for you is right. You know, mm. so, so I would actually love to lean in more. Because it's not like, oh, well, you know, if you're a Buddhist, fuck off. Well, no, if you're a Buddhist and that works for you, amazing. Yeah. Um, and if you're a Satanist and that works for you, amazing. Because, by the way, life is terrifying either way. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, I tend to be, I try to be very open-minded about those things. Again, one, when it ever passes the boundary into being, well, Steve, you need to agree with this. Well, that's a little different. But, you know, if you wake up and... You know, like any of these, any of these mythologies make you feel more content in your life. That's exciting for me. Mm. Um, it just, you know, I, I just need you, you know, you just shouldn't expect it to be exciting from, uh, you know, or, or, or to make me contented mm. in the same way. So um, if, yeah, if there is a message yet, yeah, it's not that, oh, everything you thought was true is wrong. It's that everything you thought was true is true, but also your neighbor, what your neighbor thinks is true is true. Because when something is unknowable, by the way, you can't fucking know. Right, right. Uh, and I know that that seems absurd, but I've always, you know, one of the reasons I stepped away from all these things is I had a lot of friends who were who were Muslim when I was younger. I had a lot of friends who were religiously Jewish as opposed to ethnically. And I couldn't like sit there and be like, well, those people are going to hell. Well, no, these are good people. Uh, so so um, they can all be true. You know, that's what being unknowable means. So you're taking so something that can't be defined and you're defining it in a way that brings you joy. So these demons then are just as capable to possess the obviously the non-Christians as they are any other group of individual religions, whatever. I guess they are most able to cross fates because of their oh absolutely like they may not be demons if you ask them uh for the reasons we just discussed but their power is very much a reality and it's not dependent you know because once again if something is true it doesn't matter if you believe in it or not right <laughs> so like i said I, I really loving extras never die um how many issues is this slated for and when and where can our listeners get their copy well, we're six issues for the first arc. We're out April, early April. I want to say April 12th, but that's completely off the top of my head. Um, and it should be available, uh, you know, comic stores nationwide. You can pre-order it. Uh, I mean, like my, you know, I, I don't like to play favorites with comic stores, but I, I am, it's pretty, I, I, I'm often appear at, at Third Eye in, in Annapolis and they do ship. So you can pre-order there. You can pre-order the trade paperback, of course, uh, anywhere books are sold. Um, but we will be out there. And, and it bears mentioning, by the way, that on top of everything I've just said, because we haven't said his name yet in this interview, Sebastian Pires is doing amazing, amazing mm. career-defining work on this book. I've been dying to work with Sebastian for a long, long time. I've been a fan. You know, I was, was the minute when I knew he was coming in the book, I started retweeting his work so people get excited. He's amazing. You know, uh, like Sebastian takes, I, I describe comics as starting a conversation uh and like that's what it is but if i start at like a normal voice uh conversational voice like sebastian turns it into like a a shouting fight in the best way it is it is so good mm. it's so electric he does everything from pencils to colors and uh, like issue one is killer and issue two with his version of lust a thing that i thought was going to gross him out and maybe he couldn't draw uh, not only did he draw, but he made it better than I ever could have imagined. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like lust is someone you get inside. And that's all I'll say about issue two. Like, like I said, I will say the art is absolutely gorgeous. He did a fantastic job. So uh, I think one of the great things, once again, is working with an artist like Sebastian and with his love of talent. How does so in, in a writer work with someone who is that talented? Are you giving a lot of details in what you want him to see? Are you letting him have free reign of what he's drawing? How does that work? Uh, much like a tourist in New York City, your job is to get out of the way. Uh, <laughs> and, and you think I'm joking, but I, I said that earlier. Like, 
Listen, you can write a comic script and assume that everybody works for you and everything needs to be drawn and lettered and colored to a T and you'll get a comic out of it. But what you won't get is a series of collaborators that feel respected and vital. So, you know, I send a script off to Sebastian knowing that he's a master of his craft um, and he knows what the fuck he's doing. He doesn't need me. So, um, yeah, like I have my ideas, but I know that each page, again, is just the start of a conversation and and as long as we get from a to b on the page i am not the guy that's ever going to care how we get there because if he has a better idea than what i put down why the hell would i say anything about it you know like what's important to me of course is the a to b you know there are there are certain things that need to happen um if i say that sid and ellen are are drinking coffee which they don't uh in the book but they're suddenly sitting at you know fucking ihop eating flapjacks well then maybe that's a problem because they were drinking coffee for a reason but if sebastian has a way to draw a coffee drinking scene i don't know why i'm sitting on this metaphor if he has a way to draw a coffee drinking scene that i've never heard before and is better than anything i've suggested in the script we're right back to get out of the way steve because you know i, I don't work with people uh i wouldn't be working with people if i didn't have immense respect uh, for them and what they do and what they probably spend just as long as I've spent training to do or longer. So I'm never angry when when things change from the script um, in in the telling. Uh, I'm never angry when things change in the telling from the script to the page because again, like I have immense uh, care and respect for my collaborators and to go along with that, I have to understand that maybe they have a better way and that's just fine. Now, as someone who has written for um, DC and also uh, Marvel, is there a difference between a partnership in when you're doing independently versus when you're working with Marvel? And how is does that work? Um, there's fewer people in the room uh, when you're doing an original, you know, just by definition. But I don't think, but but the, but the base idea is the same. That said, you are dealing with input from more people on any light. This is not just about DC or Marvel. This is not Steve, you know, takes a dump on any one company. <laughs> but it, but but part and parcel to any licensed work, as you would expect, is that there are more people in the room. You know, uh, you know, if working on Wonder Woman like I did for like two years, um, it's a billion dollar IP. More people are going to have opinions, uh, you know, and and it's and it's perhaps perhaps pompous of me to be like, oh, this is my Wonder Woman run and I'm going to do X, <laughs> Y and Z. It's yes, it's my run on Wonder Woman and, and I've been hired for my ideas as with any book, um, but I don't own that character. Uh, and, and so the expectations that there will be more people in the room offering opinions, um, but that's not a negative. It's just different. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's also to be expected. I think that it's it's. You know, love to people who think that they like like own a couple years of a run of a character, but even a couple, even a ten year run is going to be a drop in the bucket overall to a character's lifetime, and those don't exist anymore. So, I try to look at it with a level of humility, more so uh, when coming on a licensed work. But that is again just because that 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 that's part of the game when working on a character that you don't own. When working on stuff that you do own and that's original. It's the same type of thing, but at the end of the day, it's me and Sebastian and the letterer and the editor. It's mm. four people. You know, it's not, it's not, you know, the 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 creative caucus that exists with any any licensed uh any licensed character. And again, that's not bad or good. It's it's just different. So how does it feel to be in the Marvel universe and be in that massive structure? Um, how you know, how do you exist with your title within the larger because Marvel and DC, they're always working towards a larger event and a larger cohesive verse. How's that experience like? Uh, I mean, listen, I, it's funny. Like I, People think of me as a DC guy. It was always like, oh, Steve, how could he go to Marvel? And and I do love DC characters. But as we said earlier, the first comic I ever bought was not a DC comic. It was a Marvel comic. Um, and, and it started the West Coast Avengers, which maybe is why I like B, C, and D list characters. Um, so it's daunting uh it, i mean it was daunting to join dc in 2014 2015 in a public facing sense um it was i mean look like when i was on wonder woman i met my current boyfriend and like he thought i was a catfish and i was like listen the pictures would be much better <laughs> uh but you know it's like not a, i mean like when you're on a book and not a character like that 
for those couple years on and off that I was in the book, I'm the only person in the world writing the book Wonder Woman, right? So like it is daunting. And and that goes, I mean, you know, especially a thing like Scarlet Witch, like I'm doing now, not that joining the X-Men group wasn't, but people are so passionate about Wanda Maximoff and she hasn't had a series in a fair bit of time. And she's gone through some shit, as you might know from TV and comics, uh, not to mention her Avengers United We Stand costume. So like she's been through a lot of stuff. And uh, and so it's intimidating and it's daunting, but it's also exciting, uh, you know, because I've known uh, since taking on Supergirl, especially how much these characters mean to people on an individual level. So there's a huge responsibility, but there's a there's a thrill and a drive in getting to tell the next chapter. Uh, and again, like I said, like the way I talk about being a creative being in a creative team for a book that also extends to being in a creative room for a line. So being at Marvel, you know, being in the X-Men office where everybody is firing on all cylinders and doing their best work, uh, you can like draft off, off that energy, not to not to make like a racing metaphor, right? But like, mm. but it's exciting. It's exciting to be in the room. Uh, and then, yeah, so the job is to capitalize on that. And of course, try to get more people in the room that deserve to be there. So when you're writing a character like Wanda, who has a very interesting uh, history in the, in the world of comic books, um, she definitely has a certain instability towards her, as people who have read House of M can probably uh, um, recognize. How do you approach a character like her, given that she's had so many ups and, ups and downs with her personality? Do you take it all in and think about what that kind of psychology is like? Do you try to keep her with the last within the moment of what you think she would be in that moment? Well, the thing about Wanda is... I, you know, it, it's funny to say this because she's like has phenomenal cosmic power. You know, she can turn reality into her hand. Basically, she defines the extent to what magic is in some ways on a given day. But at the same time, because of everything you just said, through the lens of comics, Gonzo, I think she's one of the more relatable characters in Marvel because so many characters have. I mean, she she's kind of in a similar way to Peter Parker, and I know that's kind of crazy to say. But so many characters have a more more traditional hero's journey, and that just looks like this. Mm. But what is our what do our lives look like? Well, they look like this, and then you go back here, and then you go up here, and like you you start and stop. You have you backslide, you have setbacks, you have victories, you have triumphs, you have massive fucking failures. So even though Wanda has this life that is on the surface level nothing like ours, where she's dying and resurrecting and and lighting Doctor Doom on fire and fucking no more mutants and then killing myself so that I can unknow more mutants and all of this. If you strip away all the comics Gonzo, I think that she's one of the most relatable characters and that makes her easy to write because she is just like us. She's mm -hmm. doing her best. And, and she has not had this perfect arc of like, well, I'm going to be a hero and I'm going to overcome my single childhood tragedy a la Batman. Uh, you know, no, she's got a lot of tragedies. She's got a lot of mistakes, but you know what? She's still here and she's trying mm. to turn the page. And in a way, I find her more easy to write than other characters, easier than Wonder Woman, for example, because she really, even though she has lived a wild comics life, which we're happy to say, if you, if you, if you, if you just look at the bare bones of it, it's very much like a traditional human life. And I think that she makes her very, very relatable. I think that's why people root for her because she has to overcome despite all her power i think it's even more telling because she is so phenomenally powerful but she still struggles and i think that that's why people latch on to her because we all struggle right uh and we don't have the power to just like you know make mars into a fucking ice cream sundae like she does uh but at the same time if we sat down with wanda you know you'd have shit to talk about because she she does get it even if she gets it through this crazy lens, she still gets it. And so um, I find it, yes, she has had periods of instability. She's had periods of great triumph. But, you know, the more you push her narrative arcs into, uh, and you strip away the the, the, the the strangeness of it, the, you know, the chaos magics and the and the deaths and resurrections and the, and the, and all those things, if you just say, oh, she did this and then she did that. And she had a personal victory and a personal loss. Man, she sounds just like me and just like a lot of people. And so I think that actually makes her easier to write than a lot of other characters. Is it difficult to write a character who has that level of power? Because once you've got to keep a story tense and be, you know, shocking and have a sense of danger, the character who can literally alter reality. How do you keep finding ways to make that feel dangerous for 
Well, look, it's a challenge, but at the same time, you know, uh, it's not that different from writing a character like Superman. Um, I frequently say that the main inspiration, uh, pardon me, for Scarlet Witch is All-Star Superman. And that's not a joke, because where is he? I mean, like, it's A, it's an amazing Superman story, but much like Wanda, he's a, a character who is functionally invulnerable in, in a physical sense. So, but he's got plenty of villains and plenty of and plenty of losses. Why? Because he has uh, other pressure points: his emotions, his human, his his human connections, the people around him, the fact that he cares more than most people. So it's a challenge, but that's part of the game, you know. Uh, with 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 Wanda, and you know, all I would say is at the same time, yes, she's incredibly powerful. I made a Neil Gaiman joke earlier, but look, the Endless are by and large the most powerful characters. Uh, in the DC universe, more you know, at, at least as powerful as Wanda is relative to Marvel universe, and and you know, Dream is the biggest sad boy on the planet and could get shut down by like by being rejected at a bar, you know. <laughs> uh, so so it's all about understanding what really gets to people, and sometimes you know, it's not an energy blast or a punch in the face. Well, I want to thank, thank you very much. Uh, Seven fifty four. So I do know I, I gotta let you go, but thank I want to thank you so much for talking with me. Like I said, you are one, one of the best. So appreciate it. I'm happy to do it, man. Be happy to come back. Uh, honestly, anytime you want to promote something, 